Welcome to Career Chin Wax for the 21st Century. My name is Catherine Cunningham and I'm a career specialist who's worked with thousands of people by now. And so what I'm trying to do in this podcast series is tap into things that I've learned, things that I've come to understand over the years to help people better manage their careers and be happier at work. I'm taking a detour from the normal schedule. I have been doing a standard podcast and then I've been doing an MBTI podcast where we look at personality preferences and then I've been doing a short, sharp and shiny podcast. And I've been rotating through that way. But I've had a couple of weeks ago a catastrophic upper leg break, which has really affected my mobility and my ability to get things done. And it's easier for me to do MBTI at the moment because I've done a lot of preparation work. They're all ready to go. So I'm taking a bit of a detour and I'm doing at least two MBTI on the roll and maybe a couple more. We'll wait and see. So I want to talk first about MBTI. I love it. It's my favorite work. And if I'm, if I'm working with somebody who's not happy at work and they only have one hour to work with me, I always recommend MBTI because if you can uncover your hardwired preferences rather than learned behavior or learned skills, you can use that information to decide what sort of work to do. So, for example, when I was at the bank, my spreadsheets were basically full of errors because I don't have natural attention to detail. Now, since then, I've learned attention to detail. Anybody who works with me on resumes gets pretty amazed at everything I spot. So, yes, I can have attention to detail, but do I want to be in a job all day where I have to absolutely focus on the task at hand and notice every slight little issue? I can tell you no. So where does it come from? I want to give you a little bit of theory before we start. I'm going to look at the four separate letters, M-B-T-I, one at a time, and that will help you understand it. And I'm going to start at the back. So the I stands for indicator. M-B-T-I is not a test. So if you go online and do one of those free versions, it's pretty well a waste of time. It is only an indicator. As an accredited practitioner, I'm bound by the ethics to only ever deliver the assessment with the debrief. Many times people think when they do the assessment that they're, for example, an ENTP, and it's only when you properly explore hardwired preferences in the debrief that they may, for example, come to understand they're not an extrovert, that was learned behaviour, they're actually fundamentally an introvert. So it's an indicator, not a test. The next letter I want to look at is the T. The T stands for type. And there's two issues to look at here. The first one is there are 16 types or 16 possibilities. And that is both the strength and weakness of MBTI. The strength is from a career perspective. When people get their profile, it's like this aha light bulb moment. Often the comment is, I cannot believe this is so right. The level of detail, however, means that they forget their profile. So if I rang somebody up a year later and said, look, what's your profile? They'll probably get it wrong. For our career purposes, that doesn't matter. All we're trying to do with MBTI is stop for a minute in time, have a think about hardwired preferences, and use that information to make career decisions. And the other aspect of type is it's not tray or trait theory. So many instruments will measure you on a continuum. They'll say you're more like this than a particular cohort or less like this. As soon as you do Myers-Briggs, you will notice that it essentially forces you into one camp or the other. Now, Myers-Briggs is based on Carl Jung's work, and apparently Carl Jung said, of course, none of us are 100% introvert or 100% extrovert, for example, But you will notice it essentially wants you to come down on one side versus the other. And the final letters are MB, and they stand for Myers-Briggs. And it was a mother-daughter combination. Catherine Briggs started in the 1920s, building on Carl Jung's work. He knew of her work. She was the first person who wanted to have a mainstream application of his work. So it was really the first time in the world that anybody tried to use personality preferences to help people make career decisions, because before that, fundamentally, you did what your father did, because of course back then it was mainly men working. You did what your father did, or your career choices were extremely class-driven. 
Okay, let's move on to the label issue. Some people don't like MBTI because they think it labels them. Yes, it obviously does. A useful analogy, however, might be if you think about your favourite room in the house. So my favourite room in the house is my bedroom. I do a lot of work on my bed. It looks out on a garden. I love the connection with the garden. My least favourite room in the house is the laundry. If you look at MBTI, the bedroom is really where you are most comfortable, where you are most in the flow, in the zone. MBTI does not mean you don't change your behaviour. So yes, of course, I go into the laundry. I don't like the laundry. I find it quite soul-destroying, but I go into the laundry. And probably from a work point of view, the example would be me working on resumes and making sure I dot the I's and cross the T's. I don't really want to do that all day, but I quite happily and skillfully go into that laundry. At a minimum, somebody talked to me about this a while ago, and it's always stuck with me. At a minimum, you could argue that those 16 types are just a description of behavior preferences and that that's no different than the DSM-5, which is the uh, American Psychiatric Association's description of mental disorders. If you've ever looked at that, they will have a series of behaviors that they put underneath a label. The label might be borderline personality disorder, and underneath they'll have a series of behaviors. So you could argue at a minimum MBTI is no different than that. It's a useful catch-all of behaviours that are put under a label. And finally, if you're really sceptical, there's a guy called Dr. Dario Nardi, wonderful guy. I went to one of his conferences in Brisbane a few years ago. And since 2006, he's focused on hands-on brain research. He uses real-time EEG technology to establish the link between the parts of the brain that light up when somebody's in the zone or in the flow, doing an activity that matches with their MBTI preferences. If you just Google him, he has lots of information, interesting content and videos. And at the moment, he's producing content for a new book, and he's slowly releasing it on LinkedIn. I had a look at his work on ENTP, which is my profile, and I found it even more fascinating. So perhaps explore that as well. Okay, let's get started. Today I'm going to look at one of the 16 MBTI profiles and I've chosen ISTJ. And the reason I've chosen it so early on in the piece is because it's my beloved husband's profile. Some bits of what I talk about are going to be quite deep and detailed and others are going to be short, sharp and shiny and I'm going to end just with a little bit of fun. So ISTJ. You could describe ISTJ as practical, traditional, and dependable. They obtain their success by being responsible. If you had a catchphrase for them, it would be, take your time and do it right. They have a strong sense of responsibility and great loyalty to the organizations, families, and relationships in their lives. Let's look at a breakdown of the four letters that make up ISTJ. I stands for introverted, and introverted indicates a person who is energised by time alone. The S, sensing people focus on facts and details rather than ideas and concepts. T is thinking. Thinking people make decisions based on analysis and reason rather than feelings and values. And finally, judging. They're people who prefer to be planned and organised rather than spontaneous and flexible. ISTJ is the third most common type. It's 12% of the general population, and it's much more common amongst men than women. 16% of men and only 7% of women. It's amongst the four highest types of college GPA. It's the most likely to enjoy a workplace where everything is done by the book. They're more likely than other types to experience cardiac problems and hypertension and I know this from my husband, their personal values include financial security. They're commonly found in careers in management, admin, law enforcement, and accounting. At the core of an ISTJ is someone who wants to understand how they can participate in established organisations and systems. They work with steady energy to fulfil commitments as stated and on time. They're comfortable working in teams when needed to do the job right, 
and when everyone fulfills assigned responsibilities. ISTJs are likely to be practical, sensible and realistic. They're steady, productive contributors. They're very systematic and outcome focused. They're reliable and dutiful and logical and analytical. There's quite a lot of famous ISTJs and probably no surprises, Queen Elizabeth II is regarded as a typical ISTJ. Harry Truman, Warren Buffett, if you think of his investment strategy, Queen Victoria, and George H.W. Bush and J.D. Rockefeller. Now, from a career point of view, of course, I'm interested in finding out where each type finds career satisfaction. So this is a book by Tiga and Barron called Do What You Are. And I'm going to just give you five elements of career satisfaction. They look at 10 in the book. I'll just give you five. Career satisfaction for an ISTJ means doing work that is technical in nature and lets them depend on their ability to use and remember important facts and details. The work needs to involve a real product or service done in a thoughtful, logical and efficient way, preferably using standard operating procedures. The work needs to let them be independent with plenty of time to work alone and use their excellent powers of concentration to complete projects and tasks. The work needs to have results that are tangible and measurable, where precision and exacting standards are used and respected. And finally, it needs to be done in an environment where their practical judgment and experience are valued and rewarded. There's another book that I find really useful when I'm working with people on personality preferences. It actually strays across more into executive coaching rather than career coaching. So I really just give people the resource and leave them to it on their own. But I found with my own profile that the information was really valuable. It talks about the behavior of, in this case, an ISTJ in the workplace and then the implications of that behavior. What I'm going to do, obviously, is not go through all of them. I'm just going to take one or two elements under each of the subcategories and talk to you about ISTJs. The book is called Working Together, and it's by Isaacson and Behrens. If we start with management style, no surprises here is the management style of the ISTJ is authoritarian and decisive. As a manager... The ISTJ expects others to follow the rules and procedures without question, and they respect hierarchy. They tend to manage in a predictable and formal way, focusing on the organisation because they are unusually loyal to the organisation and the tasks to be performed. As leaders, they're sometimes called the traditionalists, since they work to preserve traditions. They appreciate the value of rituals, ceremonies and celebrations in providing a sense of belonging and permanence in the organisation. If we look at their values, ISTJs value the preservation of life, which almost always translates into economics as a way of satisfying needs. Conservation of the resources of the organisation may be foremost in their minds. These values show in their focus on utility, production and not taking chances. Belonging is important to ISTJs, so you'll often find them as active participants in organisations because membership gives them a way of gaining a sense of stability. Outside organisations are for some reason considered less important for ISTJ managers. You would expect them to show a great deal of emphasis on the membership in terms of their family and selected lifelong friends. When it comes to attitude, the basic attitude of an ISTJ is one of fatalism Things are what they are, and little can be done to change them. Hand in hand with this attitude of fatalism is an attitude of concern. ISTJs tend to be quiet, very serious, and concerned about procedures and rules, especially when others are not doing their duty. When it comes to their skills, ISTJs have a natural talent for taking nothing for granted and not reading more into a situation than is actually present. Therefore, they are thorough in the inspection of contracts and documents of importance for the well-being of their organisation. 
When it comes to energy direction, ISTJs direct their energy towards observing discrepancies, emissions, and deviations, because that way they can conserve the resources, which are often financial resources, and meet the standards set by those with adequate experience and authority. When it comes to their driving force, ISTJs have a very high need for security and stability. When it comes to their authority orientation, again, no surprises here, ISTJs have little or no patience for those who question authority. When it comes to conflict resolution, they don't see it as their job to confront those who do not conform to the rules and who fail to distinguish between right and wrong. Rather, they report the deviation to the appropriate authority. However, they may be put off by efforts to get to the source of conflict, believing as they do that we should pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and carry out our duty. When it comes to learning, ISTJs prefer to learn through concrete methods, such as workbooks that require memorization, recall and drill, where progress can be monitored and registered. And finally, if it comes to their blind spots, ISTJs may focus so much on the tasks of a situation that they may ignore the human element, and being so stability-oriented, they may insist on procedures for procedures' sake and retain the procedures beyond their usefulness and may not be responsive to the need for change. What makes them attractive to others? ISTJs are attractive to others because of their strong sense of duty, their dedication to hard work and getting it done even when they don't want to, their dependability, their strong sense of moral righteousness, the vividness of their sensory recall, how interesting and detailed their memories are, if you can get them talking about it, the thoroughness of their explanations, the sheer volume of knowledge they've accrued about the subjects they find interesting, and the secret soft side that they only reveal to people they care about. And as I said, I want to finish with a bit of fun. This is a Quora group of MBTI aficionados. They seem pretty accurate to me, but this is just a bit of fun. This is how would an ISTJ respond if they really like you? If they really like you, they will ask you out eventually, but it may take a while. You'll be surprised and touched by their effort from the details they spent putting into the date, their appearance, or their effort to go out of their comfort zone by being more outgoing with you. They'll remember the details that make you smile and try to make your life easier by doing little things for you, like bringing you a pillow while at work so that you're comfortable, or taking you out to eat your favourite food you mentioned that one time. They'll try to be around you, talking to you, or standing close to you, but they'll move slowly, making sure they can trust you before they make a move. If they don't like you, don't worry, they won't lead you on at all. Expect no coy smiles, accidentally brushing your arm or anything. Flirting is practically a foreign language for ISTJs. So where to from here? I think you can pick up that I think it's really important to know what your profile is. And if you go to the show notes underneath this podcast, you'll find further links. I mentioned earlier, if you want to explore your profile, don't do it online. It needs an accredited practitioner and a good one. Myers-Briggs is really complex. I often shudder to think about what I used to say back in the early years. If in doubt with Myers-Briggs, think about how you behave in your personal life, not work. In theory, work is more learned behavior. And if you're really in doubt, think back to primary school because that's usually the earliest we can remember before the world got to us and told us to either stop doing something or start doing something. I love the Step 2 Interpretive Report, so it's the MBTI Step 2 Interpretive Report, because that will show the effect of life on you, on your preferences, or life choices you have made that affect your behaviour. So I show up as a feeler in the MBTI Step 2 Interpretive Report, and I'm not a feeler. I'm an absolute thinker. I've concluded it's because I was brought up as a very strong Catholic and so from a really early age I was taught to think about other people and care about other people. So I think the MBTI Step 2 Interpretive Report gives you useful information to help you understand how you generally modify your default preferences 
into actual behaviour. As I said, use it to make career decisions and to thrive in the workplace, but I also use it a great deal in my relationship. Speaking of my ISTJ husband, the first time I went shopping with him, I was really shocked. But I didn't judge because I immediately thought, well, that's how a sensing person would shop. I don't go shopping with him. I meet him afterwards for a coffee, but I don't judge him. I think Myers-Briggs MBTI allows you to understand yourself and respect others, and it's a lot of fun. Thanks for listening to this podcast. I'm not sure what the next podcast would be, as I said, given my injury, but I will be doing them on a regular basis now that I've uh, recovered a bit. So stay tuned. Bye. Bye.